I keep having to talk about what is and isn't folklore. So I'm just making one video now that I can link back to in future so I don't have to keep repeating myself. And I'm going to read it out because it's complicated. When I started this project on Irish folklore, my goal was chiefly to make entertaining content. So I wasn't doing rigorous research. And that's fine. When making something that's primarily for entertainment, you don't need to hold yourselves to great standards of accuracy. But as my political views have shifted further and further left over time, I now believe that education should be free and accessible to everyone. Irish folklore is something I am qualified to make educational content on, so I saw that as a way of making a contribution to the free education movement. As such, my work has shifted from being primarily focused on entertainment to being primarily focused on education. As such, I feel a far greater responsibility to be thorough in my research and presentation and critical of my sources. My older videos were often scripted, shot and edited in a single day. Now my analytical content takes weeks, sometimes months. The entire point of my Reloaded series is to look at some of my older video topics with the rigour that I use now. Patrons will be familiar with how extensive the bibliographies I use can be, and actually I've made those open to everyone now for the videos that have them. I do not set out to debunk ideas or stories. That's not my goal. But since my content has transitioned from being primarily for entertainment to being primarily educational, I feel a responsibility to be honest about the sources I look into. If I find that individuals often cited as sources were in fact practicing extremely poor academic rigor and scruples in their methodology, I am not going to pretend that that is not the case. That would be dishonest. It would not be meeting the responsibility inherent in creating content that is primarily educational. However, to use a recent example, just because the bone whip of the Dullahan, and probably even the name Dullahan itself, are likely embellishments to existing folklore that were created by Thomas Croft and Croker in the 19th century, does not mean that they are not a legitimate part of folklore now in the 21st century. If something is in the oral tradition, it is in the oral tradition. How it got there doesn't make it any less a part of the oral tradition. For example, I created a creature called the Heron King. This creature is designed to feel like a part of Irish folklore, but it absolutely is not. It's my own invention. However, should the Heron King become a popular creation, if people start including it in stories that they tell one another, if they start including it in jokes and references and superstitions, then it would become part of the oral tradition and then it would be part of Irish folklore. It's the same with Croker's writings on the Dullahan. His idea of the creature was probably not part of Irish folklore before he published his work and I have no problem taking him to task for acting like it was. That is not just having poor academic standards, that is not just having no established standards or methodology to draw upon, that is lying. But after the publishing of his work, it has become part of Irish folklore. It trickled from the literary tradition into the oral tradition, and now it's part of the oral tradition. And that's my point. From an academic perspective, it's important to be aware of where your information is coming from and whether or not it could be considered to be representative of the oral tradition of the period it came from. 
At the same time, it's also important to remember that folklore is a living corpus. It is constantly changing and growing. And to remember that while something may not have been a legitimate part of the oral tradition in the 19th century, does not mean it's not a legitimate part of the oral tradition in the 21st century. Those are separate statements and they are not mutually inclusive.